All right. So first off, we want to thank our sponsors, our program sponsors, DPS, Genesis, ICQ Consultants, and Macy Bioservices. Thank you so much for your sponsorship. Next slide, please. Next, uh, some other information on how to participate in today's event. You will have the opportunity to submit your questions by typing your questions into the Q&A session on Pigeonhole. A link to the Pigeonhole Q&A platform has been provided to your confirmation email and should be listed in the chat box. You may send your questions at any time during the presentation and you can also upvote questions that others have submitted. We'll collect these questions and address them at the end of today's presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. On behalf of APC, I'd like to invite you to get involved with the chapter by volunteering with our committee. We meet the first Wednesday of every month, 5.30 over Zoom, and discuss and plan topics for speakers for our monthly educational webinars. We'd love to have some fresh perspectives and aliasing with speakers and industry experts is a great way to expand your network. We hope you consider joining. Next slide, please. Lastly, we hope to continue the conversation in the chapter's social media platforms listed here. You can find it on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And we'll be introducing our speakers in just a few minutes, but first we wanted to thank them for joining us. Excuse me, thank them for joining us today. Jared Marshall, uh, Principal of uh, Engineering at Rubius Therapeutics. Mike Polanski, the Director of Corporate Quality at AstraZeneca and Deborah Wild, president of DW Biopharma. And with that, please join me in welcoming today's speakers. All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, let me go ahead and quickly stop sharing and now I will pull up the presentation and we will go ahead and begin our program. Okay. Okay, so that's like from that point, I guess we'll go ahead and start if you want to go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Let me get to slideshow mode. Sorry about that. It's okay. All right. Hold on one second. Technical difficulties on my end. Here. Let me try it now. Hey. Okay. There you go. All right. Uh, Everybody can see it? Yep. Okay, awesome. So uh, first, I'd like to just kind of go through a little bit about the webinar structure, and then um, Chris will go through a little bit about ISPE and why it's so beneficial to become an ISPE member. So if you go to the next slide, please, Chris. So basically, we're going to go through the webinar structure, a little bit about ISPE, like I mentioned. We're going to go through an opening statement. I believe Chris is going to walk through that. We're going to provide some introductions to our moderators and facilitators a little bit more of uh, some background for everybody. We're gonna introduce the speakers and the panel members and give some background information for them as well. From then we'll transition into our topic dis discussions from each of the speakers. After each one of the topic discussions, we may uh, call on some of the other speakers or panel members, quick two minute discussion if anyone has any uh, additional information to provide or uh, input on that specific topic. After that, we'll go through and we'll obtain or go through the questions from the audience. I believe Catherine will be going through that piece. So you can go ahead to the next slide, Chris. There you go. All right. Um, so now I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about ISPE. So as you can see here, um, there are many different members uh, of the organization that represent all of the facets of the industry. Uh, the one thing that I love, I like to drive home about ISPE is just the collaboration and partnership that takes place um, where everybody comes together to pretty much make the industry uh, successful. Uh, so pretty much uh, there are many different hands that touch the industry. You have service providers, contractors, end users, engineering service companies, uh, regulatory, uh, contract manufacturing organizations, architecture and uh, architecture and construction, uh, supply chain, uh, to name a few. And basically everybody comes together, collaborates and ensure that the industry continues to provide safe and effective therapies and treatments uh, for the world's po population on a timely manner. 
All right, and next uh, we're gonna get into the program. One second. Uh, so now we're gonna go ahead and cut to the chase. Uh, without further ado, uh, we are pleased to present this program, ISPE Baseline Guide, Volume 5, Second Edition, Adopting the New Paradigm. Uh, before we introduce the panelists, just wanna talk about brief history of the Baseline Guide and the updates. So the first edition um, of the Baseline Guide for Commissioning and Qualification came out in 2001 as a need to align the industry and standardize it regarding commissioning and qualification expectations from a regulatory perspective. This allowed the industry to focus on product quality and risk, as well as provided new methodologies at the time, including the V model. In 2019, after many years have passed and new guidance updates have been released, uh, I'm sorry, from different industry organizations, which include ASTM, uh, ICH, as well as the FDA, ISPE updated and released baseline guide as a second edition. Some of the reasons for the change uh, include the following. Uh, so the original guide did not really dive into quality uh, risk management or risk-based approach, uh, which means that testing was not based on level of risk, whereas now it is. Um, it didn't incorporate product and process knowledge, which includes critical quality attributes and critical process parameters. Uh, the approach of the old guide was test everything. So, so CQV documentation uh, would be hundreds of pages um, on many of your critical utilities and systems and facility. Uh, now the testing is commensurate with risk, which cuts down on development work, execution, as well as review time. Um, so, as, so when the guide was updated, the intent was to help uh, drive some cost savings as well as efficiency gains and increase uh, the speed to market on some new and novel therapies. Um, as, as we all know in this industry, um, adoption to any new change or guidance can be slow at best. Um, and in the case of baseline guide, it has not been widely accepted across the industry. Uh, the point I want to drive here is that we are now in the best time to start um, adopting that methodology um, since many industry drivers, uh, obviously the pandemic, are causing pressure for faster speed to market. Uh, also, the new baseline guide will help to bridge the gap and tie in updated industry guidance. Also, with some of the new innovations happening in the industry, which include Pharma 4.0, Validation 4.0, and Continuous Manufacturing, the need to adopt this new paradigm to continue promoting innovations is more important than ever. So the presentations and breakout panel discussion that will be taking place will address challenges in adopting the updated methodology and will also include how to manage change to encourage adoption. It will also include testimonials from end users and show how adoption can lead to more integrated uh, qualification approach, allowing for faster project turnaround and cost savings. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Mike. Oh, Mike, you're muted. There we go, thank you for that. Um, just a quick introduction to myself. I've been in the industry for almost 30 years now, at least 25 years, supporting operation companies, facility expansion, screenfield projects. Um, I've been just through a whole host of um, departments, validation, manufacturing process development. It, it, it's been great. And uh, it's been great working with a lot of colleagues from around the, the, the different facilities that we've worked in, the folks that we meet on ISPE, a lot of the people in the network. And uh, it's, it's been a re very rewarding career so far. So go ahead, Chris. And I'd like to introduce myself. So I am Christopher Champa. I have been working in life sciences, including this industry for over 14 years. Uh, throughout my career, I've had the opportunity to work in different facets. Um, so I started off my career as an equipment manufacturer. I worked at Thermo Fisher um, in technical services. Uh, more recently, in the past few years, I transitioned to the field where I had the opportunity to do uh, facilities engineering, uh, validation, learn about current uh, good manufacturing practices, as well as tech transfer. Great, and at this point, I'd like to go ahead and turn it back to Mike uh, to introduce Deb Wild. 
Yeah, actually, you know what, Deb, you want to, I'm going to change it up a little bit. You want to go ahead and give yourself a brief, uh, brief intro? Sure, sure. Well, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Deb Wild or Deborah Wild. Um, I've, I've been in the industry over 30 years, so <laughs> I stopped counting at 30 years, but um, with various uh, responsibilities in manufacturing, quality assurance, quality control, assay development, regulatory affairs, validation, and recently worked with Mike at Par Paragon Catalent, um, gene therapy, and I'm um, really happy to be with you today and hopefully um, provide you some guidance on this transition. Yeah, oh, thanks, Deb. Thanks for thanks for being here. This will it'll be a very uh, some good interesting topics. Uh, Mike Polanski, um, if you want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself real quick, that'd be great. Sure, uh, Mike Polanski. I work in corporate quality at AstraZeneca. I've been there for the last seven years, uh, and I've over the twenty three years of my career, I've worked in various roles within manufacturing, quality, validation, engineering, uh, and now quality again. Uh, various companies such as Sanofi, Senecor, which is part of Johnson & Johnson and GlaxoSmithKline as well as now as AstraZeneca. I have a lot of experience in uh, facility startups uh, throughout my career in the various roles and uh, you know, seeing the evolution of where we've been since the early 2000s to where we're trying to get to now is a more of a standard streamlined approach to delivery of equipment and assets and projects. No, thanks for that, Mike. That's uh, some impressive background, that's for sure. Jared, would you like to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jared Marshall. I am a process engineer at Rubius Therapeutics uh, based out of uh, our Smithfield, Rhode Island manufacturing site. Um, over the course of my career, the past 13 years or so, um, I've been on the end user side uh, as a process uh, and project engineer, um, supporting um, uh, new facility, uh, greenfield type projects, uh, as well as facility um, renovations, uh, transformations, um, as well as um, uh, helping in the development of um, commissioning qualification programs from the ground up. Um, so um, I've more recently gotten into um, the cell and gene therapy side, um, you know, after my time, um, uh, Sanofi Genzyme uh, and a Biogen supporting more MAB, traditional MAB processes. Um, I was um, uh, worked for uh, Bremer Bio and the transformation from the, the, on the Cambridge Mass facility um, and, and getting that started up uh, into a commercial ready state. Um, and since then, um, uh, have uh, been working at Rubius to also transform um, a, a traditional MAB facility um, up into a, a, um, a GMP. Uh, uh, a cell therapy manufacturing facility. Um, so I'm happy to be here today and, um, and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Oh, thanks a lot, Jared. We certainly have a lot of uh, great talent here as far as uh, with the speakers and some really good topics. I think uh, at this point, we should probably just jump right into it if you want to go to the next slide. And then uh, Deb, if you want, you can take it from here. Sure. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide. So, you know, I think the first thing we would like to talk about here is just the reluctance in the industry to start following a revised uh, baseline guide. Um, and, and overall, it just, it costs money to change, right? So resources, either it's money, time, um, you know, to your, to your project end goal. So, you know, some of the things to think about are, are your quality systems and other programs um, non-existent or not mature in order to, to support these new guidelines. So there are three things to consider to really think about a life cycle approach. So a life cycle approach um, will then, you know, aid in simplifying the complex. So what we mean here is, you know, start with some basic process mapping to identify areas in your quality system process that can be streamlined when applying aspects of the new guide. Uh, for example, some firms are applying the system and component level assessments in a vast degree of complexity, um, rather than maybe thinking about the best approach in a unit class strategy or an, and an overall life cycle approach. Um, you know, the unit class strategy uh, allows a simpler and clearer and consistent approach to identifying the impact and aligning acceptance criteria. 
Although this revised guide provides defined qualification scope, the commissioning scope is really not well defined in this new guideline. So um, that is uh, potentially causing some, some concerns. Uh, the next item is develop. Oh, oh sorry. No, there's the, I'm just on the first one. Sorry, I'm trying to go fast. <laughs> no, that's okay. My apologies. I, my screen, I thought, was having an issue. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Um, so the next one is, to, you know, develop a requirements library. So, you know, thinking about your uh, beginning with your end in mind, you know, I know we all kind of quote Stephen Covey from time to time in our careers, but, um, you know, in your documents library, better uh, organize your critical and non-critical data. Both are as important from this perspective. So um, if you organize your critical and non-critical data in a library um, that the mechanical and automation critical attributes are clearly defined, with that data, the documents organized uh, in, and they're organized into a hierarchical approach with the full life cycle in mind, the equipment module and control module testings can be more consistently leveraged into unit operations. So um, hopefully you're following that. So then your unit procedures and verification across multiple systems can be accomplished with less documentation, less people resources, and overall end user costs to the business. Um, this also aids in the engineering change management system um, at the end of the day, because um, these critical plans help lay the foundation for management of the system throughout the life cycle of the system. And then the third thing to think about, um, it is critical to um, have your critical testing, define your methods or procedures for verifying critical and non-critical aspects of installation and operation of the mechanical systems and automated systems. Once defined protocols will only need, once defined, excuse me, protocols will only need to have the actual data reviewed and verified rather than waste time on editing sections of the protocols over and over again that outlines the test objective procedures, the general acceptance criteria guidelines, things that you see in every protocol. You don't have to keep repeating that over and over again with, in add infinite item number of protocols. And since you simply need to identify predefined criteria meets actual criteria verified in the field or is leveraged from something like a Cal cert or something like that. Um, it's again important to note how important a mature change management process supports this approach. So again, if you have a life cycle approach, uh, it aids your change management, but you need to have a mature change management approach to your quality systems, your engineering change management. No, oh, thank you for that, Debbie. Mm -hmm. um, I was just going to ask real quick, Jared, as you, uh, as a panel member, um, did you, uh, do you have anything that you might want to add to that or? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> I mean, Deb, Deb covered it. Um, I, I do think, uh, I mean, the most critical step uh, really are the, are the first steps really in identifying um, and, and putting some, uh, some time and effort into your system impact uh, document. So sometimes called an SIA, system impact assessment, system impact critical aspect, aspect assessment, um, identifying your critical aspects in that document. Um, and then um, that really drives um, what the criticality of that particular uh, piece of equipment or system, whether it uh, is a direct impact system, uh, indirect impact system, um, or no impact system. Um, and from there, um, that really determines, uh, that's really the, the kind of the roots of, of what determines the level of testing that you're gonna require moving forward. So after you have that um, SIA developed um, with quality buy-in, um, you can then prepare your, um, you know, your, your user requirements um, and inherently, um, you know, if you, if you had a, a SIA that said you had a direct impact system, you know, you'd have some user requirements that are then classified as um, like a product or process impact. Um, so uh, just really just uh, highlighting the importance of um, uh, identifying um, the criticality of the system up front, um, as well as then you know, going into your user requirements and, and, and picking from a library, like Deb said, because, um, you know, you, you don't want every document um, to have uh, its own little flavor, um, because from a re review standpoint, that just adds complexity. Um, so having that you know, library of not only critical aspects, but library of, um, 
you know, user requirements and, and, and user requirement sources, uh, yeah. whether it's, uh, you know, on the, it's the standards or local regulations uh, or even internal, um, internal documents. No, thank, that's a good point. Thank you so much for that. Another good point real, that I wanted to just kind of circle back and mention is the, the process map, I think is, that's key too. It's almost like a little work, work breakdown infrastructure, you know, for the uh, interdependencies is good to, good to have. Um, now let's, uh, if we can, Chris, we'll flip to the next slide and uh, we'll let uh, Mike Palancy go through his. Hi everybody. Uh, what I'm gonna go through is a little bit more about the overall program, <clears throat> excuse me, implementation of a program change um, and, and is the ability to manage change uh, from a program perspective, one of the barriers or challenges to ICQ integration and success. So if you wanna to click to the next slide. So there are very real perceived barriers, very, very real and perceived barriers to every change opportunity. We call them stop barriers and they're voiced or internalized before we even start. Uh, these challenges, uh, these challenges are motivation and our ability to initiate this change. And although we are normalized uh, to this, you kind of have to start with a simple question. Are you happy? If the answer is yes, you keep doing what you're doing. If the answer is no, you ask, do you want to be happy? If the answer is no, then keep doing what you're doing. But if the answer is yes, then we need to change something. When something needs to change and there really never seems to be a good time, that means that any time and right now is the time to start. And that's some of the barriers that I know that in my past that there never seemed to be a good time. You know, we always get those, we don't have the bandwidth. Uh, we don't have uh, the ability to demonstrate success on this because we, our portfolio doesn't demonstrate it. But if the program itself needs adjustment, it needs change. We need to ask and challenge ourselves and be motivated we are to actually kick it off. So if you want to click to the next slide. So this is, uh, this is a change framework that's uh, adopted from John Cotter. He's the author and professor emeritus at Harvard Business School. And many of you may be familiar with it. I know here at AstraZeneca, they've actually incorporated it into an overall program. Uh, so you start with it creating a sense of urgency, going back to that, how motivated are we? We need to create a sense of urgency for our change. Um, it's a little early, but okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, we need to build a, co a guiding coalition and uh, form a strategic vision, share the vision, enable action, generate those short-term wins to maintain momentum, and then sustain that acceleration to the point where we actually institute the change. So going through the um, first four elements, I think are the core elements. It's where most change uh, opportunities kind of break down. Uh, take an initial look at those stop barriers. That sense of urgency needs to boldly and clearly answer those whys of the importance of the change. And the guiding coalition that you're building, it needs to have three main, main things. It needs to have people with the skill required to organize, build, and drive the change, the, ability, the availability to dedicate necessary time to the effort, and the passion in getting it done. So based on our past and present uh, it, it experiences, we need to look at and set that strategic vision, which sets the vector to the future, right? Incorporating both the benefits that we want and acknowledged risks in meeting those conditions, I call them conditions of satisfaction of the key stakeholders of the process. So then we broadly share that vision and in sharing that vision, we build the momentum of the commitment to making the change and build a volunteer army of supporters and contributors to success. So next slide. So in the past, we, uh, in setting our strategic vision, in our past, we had completely segregated testing ownership, which led to high redundancy, rework, cost, and lack of schedule control. I mean, we've all experienced this. I'm sure it was normalized for most of us. And all this effort did not do anything to really to improve our ability to achieve quality as an end result. So in our present, you know, we've identified some opportunities to leverage testing and results. And we have some more front-end loaded presence of quality process SME but the testing efforts are still rather distinct and separate and modern improvements to cost, schedule, control, and quality have been achieved. But we have to look and uh, you know, ask ourselves, you know, have we really achieved some conditions of satisfaction? So if you give me a bump there, Chris, this is based on some real life uh, projects that I've, been experience, I've experienced and led. 
uh, you know, I have a non-leverage project and you can see the amount of uh, labor effort associated with the uh, critical system. So that's a per hours per critical system and then a leverage project in comparison. And you can see there's some benefit to uh, some reduction in labor hours. So that's kind of like the illustration of cost. And then the illustration of quality and right first time effort is how much rework with regards to deviation did we have? Um, and you can see there's a, there is a significant reduction there, but the question is, are we satisfied? Next slide, please. So in the future state vision, commissioning and qualification are fully integrated as a single effort as outlined in baseline guide volume five. And starting with the end in mind, as Deb said, you know, quality behavior as an expectation is pushed to the front of the project. QA and SME involvement, including the owners of the process, are also front end loaded. Process definition becomes a precursor to design with CQA and CPP defined and assessed for risk at design and verified throughout the process. And robust testing is aligned to meet the expectations of the ultimate customer of the process, the patient. So what matters most to the patient? It's a very Six Sigma lean methodology and mentality. So robust ICQ planning addresses the interdependencies and the risks to right first time testing and delivery. And what it looks like, if you give me a bump there. So adding on a integrated CQ project, you can see a further reduction, much more significant from the leverage project in the total hours per critical system invested to delivery. And then more significant to that for me was the quality right first time demonstration by looking at the significant reduction capability and deviations per protocol. So these are real numbers. These are real numbers from three different projects that were run at the same site between the years of 2006 and delivery in 2011. So over a decade ago. And the capability to do that um, is based on a lot of the findings that are in baseline guide five. Okay, next slide. So in trying to really demonstrate how we can be successful, you know, we're, we're changing, but how closely do we align with that vector uh, that we established in our strategic vision? So measures should align directly to the conditions of the sat of satisfaction of our key stakeholders. If we have quality measures where we focused, as I demonstrated, on a system by system deviation rate. Right, you can look at qualification protocol reduction, validation deviation uh, target reduction. Uh, then there's cost measures. There's many cost measures. Percent reduction in labor hours per system is probably one of the easiest ones to capture. Uh, you can demonstrate a percent reduction in total installed cost. Uh, and that's a, a really big thing where we're talking about that there's a reduction in overall capital investment of a lot of companies right now. And the speed to market is even more important. So that total uh, reduction in capital cost is important, but then you also have the ability to be very predictable in your schedule. Uh, the project schedule adherence that percent on time delivery by system can be tracked internally and also project delivery on time. And then, you know, there's other benefits like procurement. Uh, the procurement benefits with regards to standardizing the designs based on CQA elements and process definitions that become uh, much more robust as you evolve and mature in this process. Your vendor selections become much more uh, honed in and narrowed, and it gives your uh, procurement pro uh, procurement department a much better uh, purchasing power. Some other measures that are a little bit more lagging and it takes a little bit more mature process, uh, the uh, operational efficiency of your equipment, uh, you know, productivity over runtime and maintainability is a really big key when we do things right and we deliver to the expectation, you know, mean time to repair the maintainability and reliability, which is the mean time between failure uh, percentages uh, offer some improvement. So these are all lagging indicators. And when you set a program up and you start to uh, go through your first project or program initiation, you know, setting some internal CPPs to your process that you're, you're, in, uh, you're instigating there, uh, you, you need to have some sort of internal uh, program measurements. You know, so how much of the percent of URS accuracy have we achieved? Uh, how, you know, how aligned are we with our DRDQ process and have those checks imbalances within the process. And that's part of maintaining that momentum as we go forward. So that's all I have. Uh, there's any additions. Awesome. Thanks, thanks for that, Mike. I, I was actually gonna mention, I, I, I found it really interesting how you compare the old V model to 
you know, today, and I haven't seen that done a lot. And that, that was actually kind of neat. And then the other, the other thing that, that was interesting, how you discussed how it was truly one process now. And I think one of the things that some people might have for issues is um, when you have quality groups on some portions of the, the process and engineering groups on other kind of makes it a little bit difficult because they do have slightly different processes. But thank you so much for that. Um, let's go ahead with the next slide. I believe Deb um, is going to be going through first. Next topic. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, we want to talk a little bit about, you can go to the next slide, um, what the transitional methods of implementation, um, what are the benefits of that, you know, and Mike, you did a great job, you know, talking about the benefits of, you know, looking at the, the new guidance um, and, you know, converging as Mike Bogan just mentioned, the commissioning with the qualification. You know, and, and I think to begin with, and I think just being part of, you know, corporate America, uh, it's important that when we want to make this transition that we make it, you know, one of the corporate goals, you know, so that, so that the people who do the budget know the why behind why is it taking longer or, or why do we have to hire extra people just to kind of get through this first bump, but in the long run, we're going to save that time and money that Mike just talked about. Um, you know, we need to make sure it's part of your corporate goal, um, your department goal, and there's some budget associated with that transition. Because um, there is a cost to compliance, we know that. But then, you know, looking at Mike's data, at the end of the day, you can also ensure, assure those leadership folks that, um, you know, that there is a benefit to going through this, this process. Um, you know, and it, we can take into account the realistic timeline for commissioning and qualification now, um, the required documentation, tagging, handoff to GMP, and so on. Um, and, you know, when you talk about this, you know, oftentimes we're thinking about new facilities, new equipment, but this could be existing facilities and equipment um, that's transitioning to this new approach as well. Um, and then, um, you know, we, we have to work to determine what the hybrid approach is, you know, uh, because it looks great on those colors and, you know, that everything's put together, but you really have to have this mapping. And Mike Bogan talked about it earlier. We are repeating ourselves a little bit, but you have to, you know, have this process map um, on what that hybrid approach looks like, not just the process map of the, the system or the automation, but, um, you know, what does that approach look like? And I think the biggest hurdle to ensuring sufficient quality oversight sometimes um, of the early stages of the process is, which means the FAT or the SAT or um, you know, certifications is this work can be leveraged as qualification. So um, you, know, you can bring all that up earlier as, as Mike Polanski mentioned. Also, it always seems to be a challenge to prospectively identify what aspects of the equipment system will be tested and at what stage um, of the continuum. This should all be based on the system impact assessment that you've done to begin with, um, which dictates what aspects are truly critical and, and when and where they should be tested. And you know, the leverage, um, uh, for lack of a better word, the leverageability of things, sometimes you don't know until you get into your qual and validation uh, aspect um, to, for instance, look at a cert to see, you know, does it really contain the information that you need? So you need to come up with in the beginning um, what your overall acceptance criteria or non-acceptance criteria will be. Next slide. So this is just a, you know, a simplified uh, slide to, you know, when's the best time to implement this transition plan? And, you know, it's any time. And, and I think you know, we were saying that earlier as well, whether, um, you know, commissioning a new facility, um, you know, bringing on a new program, a new process, um, any time is impo it's important to do this. Um, but having organizations, so this, this triangle basically depicts that your project planning and project controls for that transition are really, really important. They're your foundation to your success um, of this transition. And, um, you know, using cross-functional teams, identifying what those team members do uh, and which aspects of the CQ and B integration are they responsible for. Thank you for Next that, Deb. That's, that's good. And I, I can't underscore the importance of project control. So that I guess I'll ask, um, either uh, Mike Palancy or Jared, do either of you have a, some uh, quick input on that topic? 
Um, Jared, go ahead if you're going to go first. Go ahead. I was just going to mention something about the leveraging of FAT and SAT testing. So um, my experience has been that you'll get a different level of documentation um, uh, or in-depth uh, level, uh, de depending on the supplier or vendor you're working with. So just going into that and understanding that you will see um, different levels depending on um, who you're working with and um, set up your system uh, with the ability to address those gaps uh, in those documents um, in a in a supplemental wrapper, wrapper protocol. So, um, you know, don't try to get all the suppliers to to conf, you know change all of their protocols to to meet all of your 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 QA needs. Um, I, I would be prepared to you know ex accept the documents uh, as is and then identify the gaps and address those gaps uh, in a wrapper protocol um, that can then be leveraged uh, along with the FAT and SAT protocols. And just to just to add on to that, um, my experience was um, the, the goal was to test everything as early as possible. And we looked at SAT and FAT as opportunities to accomplish that. So our planning was we knew we had to accomplish these things based on risk. Where we needed to do that was based on what was the earliest opportunity we could achieve that without fear of repeating it. Right. If we did it too early and there was going to be the risk of modifications, then we would have to retest. So as early as we could do it. And the benefit to that is when you can push things back into the process, especially at FAT, you're testing with the vendor and you're getting their A team. Right. When there are issues that need to be resolved, you're getting their A team on their floor with their best tools and their best people. When you defer you know, that type of testing or challenges to later on in your process, you're not necessarily going to get that same A team or A possibility. So you're, you're, you're going to have a different result. And so we really focused on trying to push uh, back uh, into, the, into the process as far as we could, push that opportunity for testing uh, to, to, to gain time and to gain benefit in having the right people at the right time. No, that's a good point. Thank you, Mike. So if you want to go to the next slide, I believe Deb has uh, her last topic. And then uh, we'll keep moving right along. And you can go to the next slide. You know, we've all been living a life of, you know, uh, pandemic. Uh, you know, not only are we often isolated to our webcams, um, but then your uh, operation warp speed for many of our facilities, contract facilities, our, our own products. Um, you know, we're trying to meet guidelines and also move as quickly and as efficiently and in and, and highest quality manner as possible. So, um, you know, I think positioning the project in a ready state, you know, thereby, um, sorry, thereby ensuring that programs complement the associated work, uh, data is a bit readily available to generate documents and quality systems that are in proper state of execution, um, that the resulting activities would be executed more effectively and efficiently. Um, you know, that's, that being said, um, you know, we need to, to do that. We need to determine the engineering deliverables and the prerequisites and timing, duration, resource teams needed. I know this sounds a bit repetitive, but um, you know, ask yourself what documentation from what vendors can be leveraged, CAL certs, testing and balancing reports, ETOP requirements, and so on. And then in those inputs and outputs, um, you know, uh, they need to be thoroughly reviewed uh, and, they, and see how they complement the related task or deliverables. So many times this is kind of overlooked. You know, we don't understand um, oftentimes, you know, where things interact and what impacts the other item. Um, what does quality need to sign and when? Um, for instance, you know, non-critical, critical documents, um, you know, separating those out, as I mentioned earlier, oftentimes allows your quality not to review non-criticals because you've already obtained their approval not to, you know, approve those non-critical aspects of the system. So, I mean, the, the little picture there says it in much more simplicity, but never overlook the power of simplicity. Do you want to go to the next slide, please? So, you know, last slide here, you know, I'm not going to say a lot because it says it on the slide, but simplification, core of simplification really is have the right team, um, make sure the right leadership is there, they can make decisions, they know the guidelines, they have experience, 
Um, and then of course that leadership, you know, we talked about that the corporate part, they know the budget and the timeline and um, always continue to forward, to move forward in the direction and maintain momentum, look for results, measure the results as Mike Polanski had mentioned. You know, that always provides feedback to people on the shop floor that we are getting better. We are improving by transitioning. Cause it always, as I mentioned before, it seems like it's extra work and maybe monotonous, but um, at the end of the day, it's going to improve everyone's life and turnaround time. And then one of my favorite speakers, Colin Powell, um, you know, great quote here is leadership is solving problems. The day soldiers stop uh, bringing you their problems is the day you have stopped leading them. They have either lost confidence that you can help or concluded you do not care. Either case is a failure of leadership. Thank you. No, that, Any that, additional that, comments? That's a, great, that's a great quote too. Who doesn't love Colin Powell? <laughs> Mike and uh, Jared, um, did you guys, have, anyone else have any uh, input on, on that topic? Uh, just, just simply, you know, it, it, again, simply on simplification. I think when you look at the program as, as an overall entity of implementation, if you don't break it down into simple core steps of what you need to accomplish, it becomes daunting and it seems unachievable. And, and so to break it down and to attack it in bite-sized pieces, you know, we're not boiling the ocean or eating the elephant, right? We're we're trying to accomplish core implemental foundational stages, and I often say it's kind of like you know you want to cross the stream, and to do that you need to place foundational stones in a firm setting and to put your weight on them and move forward. You know, ultimately you may have to move sideways or depending on the way the current changes, but the overall goal is to still forge across the stream, and it may be focusing on those individual placement of stones and having the plan on how you're going to lay them out is more important than focusing on the end result and how successful you plan to be in two, three years of execution in this. It's how successful are we in each individual stage as we move forward. No, thank you for that. Thanks. Um, I believe that pretty much is the, uh, the slide deck. I think at this time we can go uh, with uh, questions from the audience. So there we go. Catherine, thank you. Also, um, while we're doing this, it looks like there is a question in the chat as well. I see. Um, so do we want to start with pigeonhole or do we want to do the question in the chat first? Well, she's, she's got this up now. I'll just start okay. here and, and, and walk through. Okay. You want to go ahead and read the questions, Chris, or did you want me to? Oh, uh, yeah, I, I can do that. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So let's start with um, this question. So what kind of impact may this revised baseline have on the FAT uh, equipment manufacturers FAT? I can comment on that one. I, I mean, I think it really just raises the bar in the expectation level. Um, if the manufacturers know that, um, you know, their protocol is, is being, um, will be uh, you know, reviewed by your quality team and have a high degree of sh scrutiny uh, because it will be later leveraged. Um, and it's gonna raise the bar and then level the expectations uh, in developing um, those protocols, e even from a, a just um, you know, good documentation practice um, standpoint where it's set up uh, appropriately and, and similarly to you know, what you would expect in a, um, uh, in a batch record, for example. Um, so it really just just uh, raises the bar um, on the manufacturer's side, in my opinion. Thank you. Anyone else have any input on that? Uh, I think I think it does raise an opportunity. Again, it goes back to that procurement opportunity as well. When you have uh, vendors that are willing to be more agile to fit this new paradigm, they're going to get more business overall. At some point, it's going to have that tidal wave of an effect. If you have multiple manufacturers that manufacture the same type of equipment. Ultimately, it's those, those, um, those other factors other than the capability of the equipment that start to come into play. Um, so it is the example that I looked at for that ICQ piece, that was a vendor that was more of, it ended up being what does great look like rather than what does good look like? And it was our first shot out of the, out of the gate with that. And we ended up accomplishing more than 90% of our overall testing at FAT. 
And the reason why we did that is they said, here's what our standard package looks like. And we said, we'll take that standard package and we would like to do this as well. What would it take to do that? Mm -hmm. And it was a part of the negotiation process. Yep. So there's opportunity there as well. Um, you know what you want to get done and you know what you're willing to settle for. And I think one of the other points too is just understand that, um, you know, build a little bit of flexibility into your leveraging strategy, right? So it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. So if you have that flexibility, you may have certain aspects from the FAT that maybe all can go in, maybe some pieces can be leveraged. So, you know, you want to build that flexibility into that. Yeah. Uh, go ahead to the next question there. All right. Uh, can you explain the link and importance of engineering change management in a leveraging process? Um, who wants to go ahead and start off with this question? Anyone of you guys want to? I can take a quick stab at it. So <clears throat> engineering change management, really, uh, you're looking um, at the aspects of your system um, that are your general user requirements, uh, safety user requirements, uh, user requirements that you've identified that do not directly tra uh, trace back to um, a critical process parameter. So um, you're documenting um, uh, those changes uh, in, that, in that engineering system, um, which is typically not a, um, a system of quality oversight uh, because uh, quality has agreed up front that um, these are the appropriate um, uh, critical process parameters. Um, and uh, therefore uh, anything uh, that don't link to those uh, are considered a user requirement that is uh, engineering uh, uh, or, or safety related uh, only. So uh, don't require that level of, of, of documentation through a, through a quality system. So uh, I really think it's, it's, it's uh, the, the leveraging piece comes in where you're, you're just not um, having to you know, go through the amount of rigor required through a quality system um, uh, for, every, for every change. And it all, all comes down to uh, uh, the level of risk. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I, I agree. I think the change management process is, is the key and there's no reason to get bogged down in all of your quality change controls or your non-critical. It's, it's a huge aspect of it. Awesome. Uh, Deborah, Mike, do you have any inputs on this question? Uh, no, I was going to okay, just agree with what was, uh, what was already said. So. I agree with Mike that you know the the quality change management aspect on project delivery doesn't need to come in until the very end. Uh, you know it's built into the process of quality oversight is built into the process of a good ICQ program, but it doesn't necessarily need to mean that every single engineering or technical aspect of change needs to be managed under our quality umbrella. Yeah, I agree. Go ahead to the next question, please. Thank you, Mike. What or who is the source of a typical library of standard test elements? SMEs, uh, quality assurance, equipment manufacturer, will the library be used for quality critical attributes or also for non-critical processes? It's a great question. Yeah. Um, who wants to start? I'll start and just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 would, I would agree. Um, I, I think what, what the aspect of the library is, is you can break things down, especially if you're working things at a, at a unit class type level where you've defined um, the, the quality attributes that would need to be verified in your, obviously in the quality aspect um, and the, the non-critical attributes that would then be contained within your, your strict commissioning pieces. Obviously um, then leveraging into the full package I just want to add that just because something is, is tied to a critical quality attribute or it's a quality concern or it's a non-critical aspect and a non-quality concern does not mean that it's any less or difference in importance to the overall success of the equipment. So the same process should be adopted for both. Yep, I would agree. And understanding that you could have non-critical attributes, obviously within a quality system, a lot of times people, when they group things into those quality aspects, uh, critical quality attributes, um, they then start bringing in other, other attributes that might not necessarily be that critical. Um, Especially when you get into things like device manufacturing, you think you know everything you know about that device that's critical, 
until it's out there in the field and it's being utilized. And it comes mm -hmm. back with a bunch of complaints that are, were tied originally to non-critical things that you just ignored. Yep. Um, tolerances Absolutely. and things like that. So to, to apply the same process from design all the way through for both is important. Yep. It's just the level of scrutiny with which it's reviewed and which avenue it falls down. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Good question. Next question, please. What is the key required? Oh, hold on one second. Sorry about that. Uh, what is the key requirements to achieve right first time when this has always been the goal? This is the repost from the Zoom chat. I would say plan, 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 <laughs> and execute. Uh, Absolutely agree. You cannot, you cannot over plan. And, and that's the way that is, it's coupled with fully understanding the expectation of a process going in and then understanding all the risks associated with maintaining that expectation throughout. Uh, right first time is, is ensuring that you've identified all those risks, you've appropriately mitigated those risks through execution, and then the end result is a foregone conclusion rather than a just a happenstance. Yeah. No, yeah, I, 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 I agree. And I, oh, sorry, Deb, go ahead. I didn't mean to cross over. I, I was just going to offer a lessons learned kind of <laughs> attribute here, just having been part of teams where you're moving so fast, you don't take time to plan, to, to Mike's comment. Uh, then you go in and you think you're you're doing the right thing and you end up on the wrong island, right? It's like climbing the ladder on the wrong tree. So I think that um, planning is really important. It often has seemed like it's a waste of time or you don't have time and resources, but it, it, it saves you time in the long run. No, I, I agree. And I, and I think different people have different understanding or expectation of what right first time really means. And I think it goes back to, you know, not overly cumbersome collection of data or project controls to be able to report on that. But I think that's a big aspect. Again, it's linked to the planning that Mike and Deb were talking about. So thank you for that. Yeah, I actually wanna add inputs to this question based on my experiences too. So I do agree about having the lessons learned um, as part of the project um, once you uh, your execution has been completed. So for example, on a past project that we did last year at my client site um, with a piece of manufacturing equipment that had to go through SAT. So we did end up having to uh, obviously leverage that and do a couple of additional tests um, as part of that process, just to make sure that we captured all of the requirements that were product and process user requirements. Um, but the other thing I wanted to add, um, we talked about ETOPS uh, in this presentation. And one thing to, that I'd like to also mention is when you do lessons learned, you also want to make sure as part of your project, you have a, a running punch list of items to make sure that everything you capture everything um, that gets addressed. Uh, obviously, there are certain things that don't fall under quality purview, um, but there are certain things that once you get the ETOP, you might realize when you turn over this uh, to operations that maybe uh, from like, for example, like a maintenance perspective, uh, they don't have uh, good maintenance procedures in the ETOP. So you just want to make sure that you keep track of that stuff. So um, when the project does come to conclusion, you don't forget about items that might come back and, and bite you in the, in the future. So. No, good. Thank you. That's another good point, Chris. I, I think, um, it's 12.58, we're running out of time, and but I, I'm not sure if we, I think we covered all the questions. Is that correct? I think there might be two more. Yeah, let's try, let's try taking a stab at this one. Um, have you thought or, of, oh, sorry, have you thought of or seen a hybrid approach since the guide is not completely binding and some organizations may not see other ways to get to the same goal? Uh, in the interest of time, uh, Jared, do you want to take a stab at this one? Yeah, I would just say in in all of my experience, I've seen hybrid approaches. There's, there's no one size fits all. Um, it depends on um, a lot of different factors within your, your company uh, and maturity level of, of the different groups in the company. So um, yes, I mean, in, in every case that I've been involved with with, with uh, developing a CNQ program, it's, it's always a hybrid approach. Uh, some of it has, has more or less, um, you know, traditional um, aspects to it, um, as opposed to uh, as opposed to uh, the uh, more newest or, or leveraged approach. Uh, for example, de degree of leveraging FAT uh, uh, or SAT testing um, that can vary. 
All right. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. I think that pretty much wraps it up. It's uh, one o'clock. Um, we can go over if we have. No, I guess that's 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 it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank all the uh, you know all the people that that took time of the day today to uh, sit with us through this. I want to thank all the speakers, uh, Jared uh, as a as a panel, uh, Mike, and Deb, and obviously uh, Chris for your help as well. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely. Thank you. This was an absolutely thank amazing you. presentation. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.